Dan, I'm going to hand over to you if that's okay. Um, and I'm going to go straight on to the uh, first question. Well, an introduction to you. Okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Rob. So can you just, um, uh, yeah, so just to introduce myself again. So Dan Caldine, one of the consultants in Worcester and West Midlands, and I, I look after quite a large cohort of patients with, um, with age-related macular degeneration. So let's just move on to the next slide, please. So I'm sure you're probably all familiar with this picture, which is a picture of the back of the eye with the nerve um, and the blood vessels and the macula area in the middle. And the retina is like the film in a camera. So your eye um, focuses the light. So the front part of your eye focuses the light to the back part of the eye. And at the back part of the eye is the retina. And the sensitive part of the retina is called the macula. And the macula has a very high concentration of photoreceptors, which specialize in both shape and color and um, provide over sort of 95% of the clarity of your central vision. And your brain is very clever. What it does is as your eyes scan around uh, a room or, um, or a painting or a book or or, or, or in your surroundings your brain actually sees things in focus as you're looking at them but then creates a kind of a mental map or a, a note of your surroundings and then your peripheral vision just looks for changes in that surroundings so if your macula is not working properly it's really difficult to see clear detail even though it's only a small part of the back of the eye I um, mean, you know, it makes up sort of less than 5% really of the, of the size of the back of the eye, uh, but it does over 95% of the, of the clear vision. And macular degeneration is associated with increasing age. Um, now we know there are risk factors and actually over the last um, 50 years, it's become very apparent that um, uh, smoking was a major risk factor for age-related macular degeneration. Um, and also um, a poor diet, um, so not enough uh, vitamins um, in your diet. But interestingly, with the rules that have been coming in force about smoking in particular, for instance, not in public places, um, the, the risk factors have become a lot less. And I think the current generation of people in their sort of 30s 20s and 30s have been a lot less exposed in public places to cigarette smoke on buses, in pubs, in airports, on planes. Um, so we, we think, we hope that actually um, age-related macular degeneration will become a little bit less common. The only problem is we are, of course, living longer um, and age is a, a risk factor. Um, and it's a it's difficult for the rest of to maintain its health, health for our entire lives. There's a, a very strong family history um, risk factor. So um, if you have elderly relatives who've had age-related macular degeneration, then it's definitely something which you need to be screened for. And opticians are very good at doing that um, with, with scanners and with looking at the back of the eye as part of your sight test. Um, it's a very common condition. So we think around 4 million people are actually um, living with some degree of age-related macular degeneration in the UK. Um, so next slide, please. So this is just to show you some of the different subtypes of um, age-related macular degeneration. So the normal eye diagram is useful because it's got a um, slightly pinker circle area, um, which um, is the macular area. And you can see that's next to the slightly yellower area, circular area, which is the nerve. So um, that macular area is where you get all the good clear central vision and when you've got dry changes um, you have um, degeneration in the deeper layers of the retina there with um, sometimes things called drusen changes um, effectively the retina is not working as well as it should do and the photoreceptors become damaged and once they start to become damaged they generally die off and don't replace themselves and then you've got wet age-related macular degeneration, which is when um, 
your retina is sort of almost trying almost trying to repair itself it realizes there's some damages going on there and some of the deeper layers actually protect the eye from a, a very rich blood supply beneath the retina which supplies it with nutrients which normally seep through without any blood they, so they sort of seep across a, a membrane of tissue um, but if that membrane of tissue breaks down when the macular degeneration gets gets quite bad um, blood can leak through into the eye and that's very destructive and we call that wet due to the fluid nature of the blood um, the two conditions um, often can coexist to some degree and dry amd can progress to wet amd um, in about sort of one tenth of uh, people um, okay so next slide please Um, so um, it's really important to, to regularly monitor for AMD. Um, and what we're really doing is just making sure that it's staying dry and modifying risk factors. Um, so making sure, which I'll, I'll come to on a, another slide. But there is some promising research in the field of um, treatment for dry AMD. And they are looking very much at stem cells, trying to reactivate the retina um, trying to almost infect the retina with the ability to reactivate itself and repair itself. Um, th there isn't really any specific treatment for dry AMD apart from modifying risk factors. Um, in its more advanced states, when you lose a significant amount of photoreceptors, we have a term where we call, call geographic atrophy, which means geographic describing an area, an atrophy describing an area of dead cells where they can sometimes replace the area with um, a retinal implant. Um, but this work is very much in its prelim preliminary stages at the moment. I think over the next um, 10 to 20 years, there, there should be some significant development there. Um, but at the moment, there isn't a specific treatment for dry AMD. For wet AMD, um, well, just because there's a treatment for it doesn't necessarily mean it's better to have it because it is quite destructive in the way wet AMD can progress very rapidly. So the only advantage of dry AMD is that it's slower to progress, whereas wet changes are often very rapid. Um, and the, the, the damage from wet AMD comes from abnormal blood vessels, which grow into the retina and leak. And so injections of chemicals designed to cause those blood vessels to regress have been invented and they're used very regularly in patients uh, throughout the UK. And these are called um, anti-VEGF or anti-vascular endothelial growth factor injections. The only problem with them is that they're relatively short acting. So they only work for between one and three months. And so you, you often need to have regular top-up injections. Um, when AMD first came out, uh, so when treatments for AMD first came out on wet AMD, there was something called photodynamic therapy, which is effectively a way of targeting the abnormal cells um, by filling them with um, a, a photoreactive substance and then lasering them. The problem with PDT, as it was called at the time, is it can actually be quite destructive, and particularly if um, it's in the central area of the retina, sometimes the results are not not always very good. And so it's become a less common treatment now than the injections. The key thing about the injections is if you have dry AMD and you develop wet AMD and you notice the changes, the quicker you have the treatment, the better the outcome. So where possible, um, ophthalmology units around the UK try and have some kind of fast track service for for patients that have noticed a sudden change is to try and get you into a clinic to have the tests and then into a, a treatment clinic to have the injections as quickly as possible. Okay, um, next slide, please. So these are things which are really important um, uh, for for controlling A and D. So the obvious one is to stop, stop or avoid um, cigarette smoking. <clears throat> Uh, which I think uh, is, is is quite obvious, really, in terms of AMD, and is becoming more socially accepted in public spaces as well. Um, generally, we talk about like staying fit and healthy. It's it's mainly because 
you know that helps with your blood pressure that helps with your general health it helps with your access to you know a, a more balanced diet um eating a balanced diet with lots of green leaf vegetables is extremely important the antioxidants in the in the in the um, vitamins in the vegetables are very important. And of course, 20 or 30 years ago, there really wasn't the same access to these um, fresh um, fruit and veggies that we have now. You know, you can go to your local st um, shop and, and, and have access to you know green leaf vegetables, green leaf salads that are grown all year round now. And, um, you know, I, I think, I think that, I personally feel that you're better off eating a balanced diet and lots of veg rather than vitamin supplements. Uh, but for a lot of my patients where they maybe can't get out to shop or they struggle to have the time to cook um, or even just, you know, the, the desire to some degree to, to cook in a safe way, then we do recommend the, the, the vitamin supplements. And there've been quite a few studies over the years of, of which vitamin supplements are best. The difficulty with the studies are that AMD is very multifactorial. And so it's really hard to standardize sometimes to say, well, does this specific vitamin make make a big difference or does this vitamin make a difference? And, and you want to try and get statistically significant outcomes or well, the pharmaceutical companies want to get, get statistical that significant outcomes and so they often combine a lot of the vitamins together so the areds was a combination of five or six different vitamins and and the two means it was the second study they did so they, they did a first study the ared s study and they then they did a second study um which was a bit larger um to try and show significance um but all these vitamins are are available in green leaf vegetables so in theory if you eat enough green leaf veg then it should be fine um, it's important to protect your eyes uh, both from excess uv exposure um, and generally we recommend wearing sunglasses when you're at outdoors for long periods um, and driving uh, but also to protect your eyes in general um, you know if you've got really bad age related macular degeneration in one eye uh, and you've got good vision in another eye, then you ought to be wearing protective glasses when you're gardening or if you're playing sport. Um, and you know, not, not to be overly paranoid about damaging your other eye, but there are some simple measures that you ought to take really to, to look after your good eye. And the thing which I really try and remind my patients about all the time is these um, monitoring um, with the Amsler grid, which is extremely important. Um, and the thing that most patients forget to do is covering up one eye at a time. So they often look at the grid with both eyes open. And, and the, the difficulty with that is that one eye is filling in the gaps of that the other eye can't see. And it's really hard to, to know if there's a change. So you really do have to cover up one eye, look at the AMSLA chart, um, document what's normal for you, and compare that same AMSLA chart with that eye again in a week or in a month, and do that every week or every month. Um, and then have a separate AMSA chart for the other eye so that you're not getting the two eyes mixed up. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So this is the AMSA charts that I was just talking about. Um, so this is a grid of straight lines with a dot in the middle, and it's a good reference image so that you can work out what your baseline um, measurements are and then look for changes in future. Now this grid, when it's held about 25, 30 centimeters from your face, represents your macular area. So that's why it's that the size that it, it is. Um, so if you are developing macular degeneration, it will show up on this grid. Um, if you hold it further away, then it, it might you might miss it. Um, if you hold it too close, um, it might be a little bit blurry um, so it's just trying to get the right distance from your face is important um, i suspect if you've already got amd you will actually notice changes now if those changes are normal for you you can draw a line under them and say well that's just how that's my starting point but what you need to do is look if those changes change okay so if you've never used one of these charts before don't be too alarmed if you do the test tomorrow and you think oh my gosh there's problem there 
because if you've got AMD, you probably will have a baseline level of change. Um, but if you do start to see just changing distortion, it's really important to get in touch with your optometrist, probably in the first instance, go and have a scan of your retinas just to make sure that you're not developing any, any wet age-related macular degeneration. Um, if you don't want to use a grid, you can use like a photo or a picture um, or a picture on the wall. And some people prefer to look at a painting on the wall um, or straight lines like um, a window with with um, looking at the edges of the window. I think the key thing is to try and be consistent um, and you know it, not to underestimate the importance of regular monitoring because if you pick it up a change quickly, then that means you're going to get seen more quickly and you're going to get treated more quickly. So you should have a better outcome. Okay, um, next slide, please. So um, <laughs> there's some simple things to do in terms of um, lighting. Um, so definitely my patients prefer um, good, good kind of like, not obviously glare from the sun, but good daylight. Um, so where possible to, to have uh, brightly lit spaces um, to try and minimize the impact of age-related macular degeneration on your quality of life. Um, and also bright lights on, on books when you're reading and to have, have good angles of lights can make a huge difference, okay? Um, if you um, live in a house that's not well adapted to your age-related macular degeneration, you, you don't want to end up having to a fall or, or stumbling. And so having kind of lights that can activate with movement is a really good idea. Um, there are very good low vision aid clinics. So if you are struggling with reading, uh, for instance, then a magnifier can help, or sometimes a VDU display where you can put the book on a, um, effectively on a stand with um, a, um, a camcorder, which takes a, an image of the, the text and makes it larger. So it, it, by increasing the size of the text, um, what it's doing is it's trying to use some of the retina outside of the macula to be able to, to read, um, or, or to try and uh, make the image spread out over a larger part of the macula. So even if there's a little bit on the lower side that's not working, the bit on the upper side can work a bit better. Um, we find um, making things bright colors in terms of better contrast actually is probably more relevant than the color per se, but um, colors can be useful um, for, for cutlery, for example, because with age-related macular degeneration, you might struggle to actually be able to see the, the tips of instruments. So if you've got things color coded, then that can be really helpful. Um, and, and the low visual aid clinics often can give quite a lot of advice. There's usually something called an echo nurse who can talk about, about how you can adapt your home. Um, if, you, if your vision drops below a certain level, you can be registered as partially sighted. And if it drops below an even more uh, lower level, you can be registered as fully sight impaired. And this does give you help with um, blue badge um, parking, for instance, and access to um, uh, more help with um, instruments like low vision, low vision aids at a better cost, or hopefully free if, if you're if you're fortunate to live in an area where they're free. Um, so it's definitely worth asking, you know, am I eligible to be registered partially sighted? Okay, um, next slide, please. Okay, so yeah, we talked about um, um, the eye care liaison offices or the ECLO offices, um, which I think is a really good source of information. Um, I mean, the Macula Society is a phenomenally uh, useful resource. Um, you know, where we're, we've been working with the Macula Society to try and raise awareness about about age-related macular degeneration, and they, you know, they've been doing this for years now, and 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 are really good. It's often local support groups which uh, we've been meeting, and that can be a great way to share experiences um, and just have some people and someone to talk to. Um, we offer a sort of a free AMD support service. It can be very difficult actually when you notice a change to know who to to speak to, to even be able to speak to somebody. It can be difficult to see your GP. Sometimes it can be difficult to see your optometrist. Um, almost impossible to see a hospital consultant quickly. 
Um, you know, you, you may be able to go to the eye casualty, you may even go to A, A and E if you think it's such a sudden change. So sometimes it can be helpful just to talk to someone and say, well, look, this has happened. What do you think I should do? And, you know, we've we've heard pretty much every scenario over the years. So we can help direct you in the right the right place. So at least give you the reassurance that you're doing the right thing by getting it checked out and you're not bothering anybody. This is the right thing to do. Um, and to do that, it's quite easy. We've got a, a free online support service, so you can join up to that for free and you can get accessed on the internet. Thanks, okay. That's so, what we're to, do you want me to go into a little bit of detail about the... Yeah, I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll end there, but uh, you know, I, hopefully that's just given you a little bit of a medical flavor of, of age-related macular degeneration and you know the difference between dry and wet what to watch out for and just to be aware of trying to modify your risk factors. So I think that that's the important thing that I tend to talk to my patients about. Thank you, Dan. That was great. Um, so yeah, just to just to go into a little bit of more detail about the uh, free service, um, as Dan said, we, we do get lots and lots of patients asking questions about uh, AMD and, and what help is out there. And um, the free service was, it, it's only been live for a few weeks. Um, it's proved to be very, very popular up to now um we uh as, as dan mentioned we've been working with the back of the society for a few months now we've um, we've been fortunate enough to attend some of the support groups and um conduct a few surveys through uh through through them as well so we've been actually we've been able to get some really really good insight and, and information back from people living with with amd which um enable us to enable us as a business to have a look at how we can really help people what can we do to provide reassurance and guidance for those who are living with AMD? Um, and all of the services that are included within the free service were really carefully grafted because of listening to the patients. How do we solve certain problems? So everything that is included within that free service is, um, has been quite well thought through um, just to try and solve some of, some of the problems that, that people with AMD face. Um, so this slide tells us a little bit more. So. Uh, first of all, everything you need to know about AMD. One of the findings that um, that came out of our surveys and speaking to patients is that a lot of patients with AMD are uninformed on the condition and it could really do with more information around what they can do to help protect their vision. Um, so as part of that service, we provide everything you need to know about AMD. So when you sign up, there's a, a comprehensive 16 page guide on the introduction to AMD that will take you through exactly what it is pretty much everything that dan has just talked but um talked about but in a uh, a pdf format to you to uh, for you to download and print off um aside to that every month you will get uh, helpful tips and guidance through our newsletters so really really useful blogs and continuous continuous content that's going to come through so if you wanted to be updated on what the, the latest treatments were um i've really advised joining just just for that really um the the rapid device line as Dan said, there's, um, there's a lot of people that don't really know what to do. If they notice a change in their vision, they're not sure where to go. And uh, the rapid device line was set up for that. It can really help patients who aren't sure whether to call their ophthalmologist, going to the opticians, going to A&E. Call the rapid device line and we can advise on what we'd recommend you do in that scenario based on what you're telling us. Um, ask a consultant service. The vast majority of patients are AMD uh, patients. Uh, do not get to see or speak to a consultant, uh, and this is because of the uh, the pathway isn't available in in many parts of the UK, uh, and it's because of the prevalence, the amount of people that are living with AMD, there isn't the capacity to to get everybody to to see a consultant. So, this is a really really great benefit that's been received really well, and it allows people to ask any question at any time. It's a digital form; you put your question in, and then within a couple of days, you get an answer back from one of our consultants. Um, and then very soon, we're going to be launching with discounted vitamins and supplements as well. So as Dan mentioned, um, we will be um, uh, working with uh, a supplier of RX2 supplements. Um, so uh, like we said, that the studies have shown that it slows down the progression of AMD by about 25%. So um, they, they will be heavily discounted through, through the free service. I think that the market leader is about £32 a month. So this will be about half the price of that. Um, so that is coming very, very soon. Um, I've seen that Justine, you've just put um, a message on the on the little message tab there. Thank you for that. 
Um, so that is a link through to the free service. Um, and it is always free, by the way. Uh, we're never going to pay for this service. Um, as a company, Occuplan is very, very passionate about helping as many people as we possibly can. Um, and we can do this through this type of service to provide as much guidance we can to as many as people as possible. Um, so hopefully that gives you a bit of an insight into, into what we're doing and, and how we can help you uh, by signing up to, to the free service. Um, so next, let's have a look. Um, we are through to the live Q&A. Um, so we have had several questions through already from, from the people that, um, uh, that registered for, for this webinar. Uh, Justine, I think you are going to um, uh, you're going to start uh, putting some of these questions to Dan. I'm going to go on mute because I can. It's it's witching hour in my house, and my kids are being very noisy. So apologise uh, if anybody can hear that. Uh, so Justine, I'm going to hand over to you. Okay, thank you, Rob. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I have some questions in front of me that have been put forward by um, people who've registered for this webinar. So I'm going to put some maybe some slightly difficult questions to Mr. Calladine. Hopefully they're not too difficult to answer. Uh, so let's start. First question I have is, does an initial diagnosis of advanced AMD make it more likely that I will lose total central vision? Um, I think... Um... I think I think that's a very a sad situation, isn't it? That someone would present present initially with really bad vision. Um, it's normally detected at an earlier stage, but I think yes, in theory, you're further on down the line than you would be if it was detected earlier. But um, I guess it depends what type you have, because if you have dry age related macular degeneration and it's progressing really slowly, then in theory. You know, you, if you modify your risk factors, you might be okay. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, I think ideally, you want you want you want to realize as soon as possible that you've got it. Uh, and what happens sometimes, which is quite sad, is that patients have it really bad in one eye and not very bad in the other eye, and so um, it often gets missed uh, because if your good eye is filling in all the gaps of your bad eye then it won't be until someone scans your bad eye or you cover up your good eye that you realize that your bad eye is as bad as it is. So I think, yeah, so I think just the simple answer to the question is yes. I think if you present already further down the line and, and um, in theory, you're further, you're closer to, to having quite poor central vision. Um, but um yeah, but equally so, you know, if you modify your risk factors, then, you know, you, you you may be able to slow down the progression. And sometimes, you know, sometimes it takes a shock to actually modify risk factors. Um, you know, if your age-related macular degeneration wasn't that bad, and some and you was someone who smoked or someone who didn't didn't eat a particularly good diet. And someone said, oh, you know, you ought to you ought to change those risk factors. You might not do it because you can see reasonably well. Um, so, it, you know, although although I'm not trying to put a positive spin on it, but if you know that you've got really bad age related macular degeneration, then in theory, you, you may be more likely to try and modify your risk factors. Yeah, which will help you in general with your general health. Thank you. Um, I should also say if you want to add a question, please do so in the chat function. If you look to the bottom of your screen, you'll see the little, looks like a speech bubble. If you click on that, if you want to ask a question, then um, we can spring some more Mr. Caladine at the end. <laughs> I, also don't, I also don't think there's a huge amount of people on the call, actually. It looks like quite a few people haven't joined. So if someone did want to speak and answer, ask a question, that would be fine too. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so I have another question. This is quite a broad question. Is there anything specific that makes seeing worse? Now, I presume that's more in relation to lighting levels um, and anything that you can think of that can actually make it worse if you're suffering with AMD. Yeah, um, so you can, one thing which patients often describe is visual confusion. So um, for instance, for reading, um, because, because the central vision is not very good, it can be really difficult to follow like um, a sentence 
And so I think using text that's larger and more spread out or using a reading aid, um, like a ruler underneath the text that you're reading can be very helpful. Um, I think poor contrast text makes it harder. So like newspapers would be harder to read than say a Kindle, which is set on really high contrast where the, the text is a lot larger. Um, so I think look for um, opportunities to try and maximize your ability to see. So yeah, good lighting, appropriate size text. Um, and um, yeah, I, I think um, trying to avoid kind of um, dazzling lights. Um, so, you know, I've got a few patients who um, always talk about, you know, difficulties with supermarket lights um, or difficulties with, there's a lady who's a, in, a, in a bridge club and they had really bright lights and, and she found that very difficult. And, and actually, when she spoke to the manager, she said, you know, you're not, you're not the first to say this. And even people with without age-related macular degeneration, it was a problem. So they, they got them changed and that was a lot better. So just trying to get the right lighting is very important. Yeah. yeah. And I, I should also add um, from an optometrist point of view, um, make sure you do speak to your optometrist about the, the correct prescription for people suffering with AMD. A lot of um, patients do have very focals, but that actually gives you a very narrow mm -hmm. reading area. So if you have central vision loss and you're trying to look through a very small area, through a very focal or a bifocal, that's actually making life harder for you. So maybe think about um, a separate pair of reading glasses so you have a full field to look through. Um, so that's, that's another little tip. Yeah, that's a very good point actually, Justine. <laughs> Uh, separate distance of glasses yeah um i have another question so it is 18 months sorry is 18 months too long in between treatments to have an appointment with the eye specialist i feel six or 12 months would be better can you advise me please yeah i think 18 months is too long um i, I think really you ought to be seen every six months at least if you've got previous wet amd and every year with dry um, people are not seen because they're just the the, the, the hospital systems are struggling with capacity. Um, but you, yeah, you should you should push to be seen, even if it's just by your optometrist. You should you should just you should push to be seen, and also you should really do the regular monitoring. So the AMSL charts once a week, once a month, um, and if you do notice a change, to really kick up a fuss and try and get it to be seen. Yeah, yeah. I think we just had a question in from one of the yeah. That's quite an interesting question. I have one dry, one wet eye, age 78, just off recently, 12 hour flight and can't read at all, three days after the flight. Might the flight have anything to do with it? Well, okay, so, I mean, the, flying has risk factors for other things. So um, with flying, in theory, you um, potentially can become hypercoagulable. So you, you may run the risk of developing another different problem, like a vein occlusion or a branch vein occlusion or some hemorrhages in the retina. So I think if you've noticed a change, definitely go to the optician, get a scan, get it checked out. Let them try and record what your visual acuity is um, and have an OCT scan of the back of the eye. Um, it could be something different to age-related macular degeneration. Um, could it be your AMD? Well, it could just be a confounding factor. So it could have just been that, you know, you've, um, uh, uh, it just could be a timing, a coincidence of timing. Um, that in theory, you become slightly more anoxic when you're flying uh, due to the, I mean, I know the, the cabin's pressurized, but I think, I think you get a slight reduction in oxygen, which is one of the reasons why if you've got breathing problems, you, you can't fly. So, could that have caused kind of like some kind of um, oxidative shock of your retina? I think probably unlikely. Um, I, I think I think probably the most likely thing is a coincidence of timing, or maybe there's something else going on there. So um, I think it's probably worth worth getting that checked out. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So my answer to that question is that's a tricky one. I think you should. I think you just need to rule out something else. Uh, yeah. And then there's another question here. I'm early on my AMD journey. One affected eye, one good. Is there such a thing as a 
dynamic Hamza grid. I find it difficult to measure the distortion from test to test. Yeah, that's a really good point, actually. Um, the, so, so what? So what I say to people is, you have an Hamza chart, one for each eye, and with a pencil you kind of draw on what's normal for you, um, and um, you can rub that out and change it in future. And then you really want to have another one that you then compare to the one that you've done. And I guess it's where the dynamic comes in. Uh, it'd be nice if there was a an IT version of this, one that you could have on a on an iPad, for instance. You could make the changes and then that would kind of record over time. We'll we'll have a look for that because I don't I haven't seen one of those, but uh, Justine, perhaps we can have a look. A scan yeah. the internet for that because I do know there are quite a lot of new apps for monitoring AMD, and I suspect if I suspect because it's such a good idea that someone's probably done that. <laughs> there are a couple of um, a couple of apps out there, Dan. Um, that we've had conversations with actually. Um, the, oh right, they, okay. These are more dynamic. They are a little bit more dynamic. They're, they're slightly different to to what a traditional Amstel grid is. There's a couple of different yeah. techniques that have been proven to be a little bit more more effective. Um, so we can definitely um, off off the back of this, Douglas. I can I can certainly uh, send some information over to you. Um, yeah. Mm, well, thanks, Rob. I think I think what I would say about that question is that the you, you're spot on with the word dynamic in terms of it's the change over time. Because uh, they'll all be, you, you probably most of you will have changes on there, but it's how those changes then change that you need to be watching. Yeah. Okay. So next question: My doctor in South Africa stopped my injections, saying it's not working. This is the correct advice. Well, injections are not without risk, and they, um, you know, every time you have an injection, there's in theory an infection risk, and that infection can be potentially blinding. So we always have to compare risk and benefit with any treatment. Now, if the wet age-related macular degeneration has caused significant scarring in the retina, in the macula, it's no longer swollen, but it's just become so scarred um, with, with some elevated scar tissue and some depressed scar tissue, it, it may be that there's actually no point having more injections. Um, there's only There are only so many injections available per day per, for patients and you, you, and th there's always an, an economic argument as well where for instance in the NHS if your vision gets down to a certain level and you've got significant scarring then you don't get any more injections because those injections have been used for people where it can make more of an impact. I think it would depend on the OCT scans so you know again this is the sort of thing that the um, free advice line can can be useful for because if you can get some pictures of your scans you can send them to us we can have a look at them and go well actually yeah I think they may have a point there because you know that that is quite advanced or or actually do you know what I think you should ought to get a second opinion because it looks like there's still some fluid there and another injection might work so you know if you can if you can get um, a copy of the scans um, or maybe even, you know, maybe even consider one of the Occuplan uh, virtual packages that we're developing where you can actually have a scan and get someone to look at it and, and try and give you some advice. So I think just keep in touch about that and try and get a copy of your scans. And if you can send us those scans, we can have a look at them for you. That's amazing. Um, I'm sure lots of people will take advantage of that. That's um, fantastic. So think about joining the free service. Like, so put the link in there. It does give you all those benefits. Um, should I carry on with some of the questions? Yeah, um, there are a few more on there, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's go to if your AMD is genetically driven. So this gentleman's father was diagnosed at 79. Is it safe to take A reds that have zinc? Any amount of zinc. Some studies show zinc may increase the onset of the intermittent and advanced condition. Okay. So so zinc is a slightly funny one because zinc is an important part of melanin and melatonin and mel melanin and melatonin i'm sure well if, if you don't know is effectively the pigment in our skin so like our freckles and our when we get suntanned and melanin helps protect against uv damage now in the eye uh the back of the eye the retinal pigment epithelial cells are a pigment layer beneath the retina which help in the absorption of 
light and the, and the modification of light. And also within the photoreceptors, um, they have zinc, um, which helps in creating the pigment in the photoreceptors that actually absorbs uh, light to be able to see. Um, so I, I think I think you need zinc. You need to have a minimum amount of zinc in your diet to keep your retina healthy. Um, but I think it's a bit on a, it's a bit ambiguous at the moment as to whether too much zinc might cause a problem. But I think this is true in general of vitamins. Vitamins like are not vitamins are, are actually extremely dangerous chemicals, um, and if too many vitamins can be very bad for you. Uh, and this is not that well known, but you know there are they are extremely harsh in in, in some instances um, and should only be taken in small quantities and ideally through diet um, or supplements, but not you know not in high very very high concentrations. So I think. Uh, you know, like for instance, probably the most ubiquitous, um, most common uh, element in our body, sodium. You know, is a component of uh, to hold the water in our bodies. You know, too much salt can kill you, but not enough salt, and and you're, you know, you, you'll you you won't be able to absorb um, water. Um, so it's just trying to get that balance, really. Um, so I think with with zinc, I think yes, it's important to have a minimum amount. In your supplements but not to have too much <laughs> sorry i think i've just it's a bit of a cop out there but zinc is a very important part of the way the retina works yeah yeah and it is found i think in small amounts in the a reds too and vitamin formulation so as you say it, it is needed as a recommended daily amount of zinc um it's obviously in certain amounts it can cause problems yeah and as i said the, the difficulty with the studies which look at these vitamins is that they're so multifactorial with genetics with exposure to cigarette smoke with diet in general with age and they're also trying to get clinically significant outcomes that they just packed loads of things into these vitamins it's very difficult to actually work out but i, I do think it's important to have zinc in your diet because without it you can't make the, the pigment which helps the eye work uh oh so you have a question actually um any food high in zinc so we've got any suggestions for zinc high food you no know, i don't know i need to I, I the only thing i know that's high in zinc is sunblock <laughs> it's <not laughs> actually zinc oxide so you but um so you can probably get it from lip balms but i don't i don't i don't know that, the answer to that actually um i'm sure i'm sure if you just put on the internet food high in zinc it will crop up. Um, I know I often do that when I'm trying to get other other vitamins and things. Um, does anyone else do, do you know, Justina? I'm just having a, a little look as we're as we're talking. The, the one that the one that people always ask me is is omega three and omega six oils because mm -hmm. uh, that's a really hot topic with the eyes. Um, and omega six is pro-inflammatory. It's oil in sunflower oil and vegetable oil. And omega six is anti-inflammatory, which is fish oils. Um, but it's very difficult to cook all your food with fish oils because it all then tastes and smells of fish. Mm -hmm. um, but there's one oil, which is walnut oil, which is remarkably high in omega-3. Um, and so we, for instance, at home cook with with walnut oil as opposed to, um, you know, any sunflower oil or even olive oil. So, um, you know, if you do have issues with sore eyes or red eyes or you are trying in general to reduce the inflammation in your body, then looking at omega-3 rather than at omega-6 would be a good idea. Mm -hmm. I've just had a little search online and red meat particularly is a very good source of zinc. Um, shellfish, um, beans, lentils, chickpeas, seeds. Okay, so there's probably going to be a heck of a lot in your diet as well, <laughs> in general. Um, uh, so, yeah, you probably don't need to necessarily take zinc supplements if, as long as you're eating a, a, a good diet. So do all injections have the same ingredients worldwide? Um, no, they don't, actually. Um, the, there's a number of different anti-VEGF um, agents at various stages of clinical trials. Um, 
they all work to some degree. They all have slightly different protocols. Some are monthly, some are every six weeks, some are every three months. Um, it's difficult to say if one's better than the other because most studies are done by the companies that make them. Um, and they, they all work to some degree. They all deliver an anti-VEGF effect to some degree. And um, I, I personally don't think it's important to try and choose which one you want. I think what's more important is to use the one that the surgeon's familiar with. Because if a surgeon is using one, it's because he's getting good results with it, he's got confidence with it, he knows how to use it. And, you know, in theory, there's no right or wrong way with these things. Medicine is about sort of trusting your clinician to make the right decision for you. But just because one clinician does something differently doesn't mean that that's right or wrong. Um, you know, just, just an example, like if you think of an operation, a surgical operation, every surgical operation is not the same, but actually the outcomes are often very similar. Um, so every surgeon operates in a different way, but the patients still get a good outcome in terms of the operation. Just because I might use like um, a Lucentis injection because I know I know what, what's good about it, I know what's bad about it, I know how to use it. Another surgeon might say, well, I use ILEA, which is a different one, but I know that I can get away with maybe doing it a little bit less frequently or I know not know what to watch out for so the familiarity of the surgeon with the agent is probably more important than you choosing which agent that you want to have um, that's just from a more pragmatic surgical perspective um, and, and also just be aware of marketing I mean the the, the marketing side of things the, the companies that make these injections that you know they, they've invested hundreds of millions of pounds in invest in, in making these and they do have quite a strong marketing comp campaigns and they will always focus on the positives and they will often compare themselves with other, other agents but generally speaking they all they all work um, and if if your surgeon uses one three or four times on your eye it's not doing what it's supposed to do they will often change to a different agent um, so I you know I know patients who've gone from one type to another type had a slightly better result and then the, therefore then they stick on that type um but then who's to know that if they just carried on the type that they had it might have settled down anyway it's, it's very difficult to know that uh coming towards the end of our, our session but uh, i think we just got time maybe for another question or or two when will there be a true viable treatment for dry amd um well i i am hopeful i am hopeful that with future generations it will become less common because of the way risk factors are, are being modified okay so i think the access to 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 good diets nutritions and um particularly in the western worlds i mean it's going to be very difficult in developing nations to, to eradicate it um i, I think a, a perfect scenario would be um, something that they've something that they've been developing in the front of the eye so in the front of the eye on the on the cornea there's a layer of cells which um, doesn't regenerate as you get older and it can often wear out and they worked out if they infect those cells with a virus which contains some dna which makes those cells then start to divide they can repair themselves and it's a, it's an amazing concept and you just wonder if there's some way that you could have a vaccine or or an injection of something which effectively will make your photoreceptors regenerate themselves and i and i think it's a version it's, it's it's not really stem cell therapy it's kind of a version of saying well your eye has kind of gone into some kind of programmed cell death and we're going to stop that programmed cell death and try and make it start growing again um, and I think that's probably the only way to cure AMD. Um, stem cell therapy is really exciting, but it's so difficult to get cells in the back of the eye. It's such a difficult place to inject stem cells and for them to become comfortable and grow. And those stem cells have then got to marry up with the nerves. Um, and then you've got the retinal implants, which is the whole kind of um, technological way of curing this. So I think I think yes, I think it will be cured. It will either be cured by um, a way to to reprogram the cells so that they 
reproduce and look after themselves and become more robust or it'll be a stem cell therapy treatment or it'll be a technological advancement one of those three things will solve this solve this problem but are any of those on the horizon at the moment i don't think so i think you i think probably 10 to 15 years from now um it is the sort of time frame that i think we'll start to see some of these treatments um but things can happen quickly i mean you'd be surprising sometimes uh, often we don't quite know what's going on behind closed doors in these uh, big pharmaceutical companies it could be that someone stumbled on a way to reactivate photoreceptors and we don't know about it yet and, and things could happen quickly within a few years um, so it's i think it's good to remain hopeful and to keep vigilant of um, any publications and that's something i'm sure rob will keep up to date with with the free service any um, type of thing that we release monthly on the free service yeah yeah and you know things like things that we do like at occupant for instance like every year there's a really good retinal update at the oxford ophthalmology conference where professor robert mclaren talks about stem cell treatments for age-related macular generation and we have guest lectures from all around the world talking about um, you know, ways of trying to reprogram these cells and talking about retinal implants. You know, it's a way we we are trying as a as a company to keep up to date. And I think if something is very relevant um, and uh, and you know, we'll get it out there on the website. So just to really try and just keep keep looking at the website for updates on the blogs and things. Yeah. Um, has anyone got a kind of a last burning question that they would like to ask, Mr. Caladine? Um, otherwise, I'd say, you know, take a look at the Occuplan website and join the free service if you feel that will help. Um, we also do have another service, our call service, which allows you to see an ophthalmologist at a far more affordable price than you would normally have to pay to see a, a consultant privately. So that may be worth you taking a look. Um, but thank you, Mr. Caladine. Thank okay, you. Yeah, no, thanks a lot, Justine and, and Rob, um, for organising this. That's, that's been great.